Hi, this is Neil with Rock Our World. Our Rock, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua. And another way I've heard it uh, pronounced is Yahushua. And we're not exactly sure in pronunciation because there were no vowels in the Hebrew language. The way things were pronounced was passed along word of mouth. And uh, what I'm going to try and do this time is go back over what I did last time, the the rough outline of the of the Great Tribulation. And it is something that's becoming more clear. And I'm going to add a few more details. That was my first attempt ever. And uh, it was something that took me several months since I started studying those three accounts of the Great Exodus so that we could uh, examine the blueprint of the final exodus, which is the Great Tribulation. And if I get time, I will go over the, the nine appointed times and the meaning of each one. And I've explained this before that the, the nine appointed times explain the entire plan of God. They're separate pieces to it to the plan that he put together from the foundation of the world. And remember, he's a perfect God. He had the perfect way to explain it to us and give it to us and had the perfect way to fit it all together. And it's all contained within these nine appointed times. And then I, I also mentioned the tenth one, uh, Lamb Selection Day. It is an appointed time, but it's not a day that's separated to observe, I would say it's more to acknowledge. And it will likely be the day in, in my scenario. And it is me speaking, uh, but my opinions are, I'm becoming more confident in them all the time. I feel God keeps showing me details and as I speak. I even get more ideas as I speak and then I go back over these and write the commentaries. So Make sure you uh, read the commentaries. Uh, finish with that Lamb Selection Day. Remember, I pointed that out. That's a very good chance. That's the day of the wedding. It was the same day that the Lamb was picked. The Lamb of God, who is Yeshua, our, our bride. Uh, he is our salvation. That's what Yeshua or Yehushua means. It means salvation. Uh, the word Jesus was just invented, best we know, by the Greek translators. They just picked a name out of the hat, so to speak. And uh, it has no meaning in particular. Uh, but being everybody's familiar with the name Jesus, we will keep using it. And I, like I've said, I've, I've kind of given you the idea that it's a, a nickname. And I'm pretty sure... Our big brother is good with it. And then at the right time, we'll all come to understand what his real name is and we'll use it more and more. But it's not like a terrible offense to use the name Jesus. Okay, I'm. Uh, there's loose ends here and there's uh, another go over, try and fill in bits and pieces that I, I might have missed. But I really, really encourage you to go right back I started with a part one a way back, and it turned out part one, I forget which episode it is, just look through the names, but it'd be good if you're really interested in this, which I hope you are. This is our blueprint for the next, uh, not only 50 years, or actually 48, 47 and a half, because we're done a year and a half of this jubilee. And it helps us know what's going to happen so we can be prepared. So hopefully you are taking this serious. But uh, you want to go all the way from episode one, uh, 172 to 179 for part one. <laughs> I kind of stretched that out. But there is one called part one, but uh, I added details uh, it's a big subject, obviously. And then pick up the part two, three, and four very recently. Okay. Um, 
I talked a lot about the Sabbath day. The Lord not only talks about the Sabbath day more than any other appointed time, but it's one of the Ten Commandments. Now, you've got to understand that the Ten Commandments are not the only commandments. They're kind of like ten, uh, start, they're a starting point. Uh, and, and then Yeshua, when he was here, he even simplified it further. He said he gave two commandments, with her, which are both found in the Torah. Make sure you understand this. To, uh, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind and soul, your whole being, and you're to treat your neighbor as yourself. Those are very specific commandments that are found in the Torah, word for word. And uh, But if it's left up their own imagination, we it still lets us do anything, because then we decide how we love God and how we love our neighbor. And that's sort of what, where the world's at, the believing world. They just decide for themselves. In the time of the judges, I should find this scripture for you. Or, or you can find it for yourself. Uh, God said that in the time of the judges, every man did what was right in his own sight. And that was a great sin before the Lord. So that's a sin when we decide how to love our neighbor and how to love God. So then God becomes more specific in the Ten Commandments. And then he comes completely specific in the 600 or so found in the Torah. And there's a few extras in the Book of Jubilees. Um, so back to the Ten Commandments, one of them is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the point I'm making here is that this is where God wants us to start. We can't just know 600 commands instantly and apply them to our life and figure them out and get comfortable with them and mull them over and, and figure out which ones apply to us and which don't. It just doesn't work that way. But we can learn very quickly. And uh, the way God wants us to start is with the Sabbath day. So then I've pointed you out, how do you uh, figure out all the different signs the noon, moon makes? You start watching it. Watch for that first Sabbath. Actually, you can start watching for the first crescent. And that's what the Jewish people call the new moon. But it's obviously not the new moon because it's just a, um, it lasts, I don't know, anywhere from 20 minutes down to five minutes like you spot that tiny crescent before it dips down in the western sky and uh, as you get closer to the equator you can see these signs much much more clearly than we can at way up here in the north of the 49th parallel where i live so that's a challenge just to be able to see that first crescent but we do have the aid of the internet you can find people that are watching for the new moon and you know, make sure it's in the same kind of general time zone you're in. Like there's three of them across North America. So you don't want to look for people that are seeing the, the moon, the first crescent way over in the East Coast or the West Coast. Anyway, uh, get familiar with the moon signs. The Sabbaths are that first quarter in the sky when it's directly 90, 90 degrees up in the sky, like straight up. Uh, if you stood facing south from the northern hemisphere with the east on your one side and the west on your other side, the moon would be straight up, you know, and uh, between the horizons, so to speak. It, and uh, you look at sunset for the first 14 days, and that's the first Sabbath. And then the second Sabbath is the day the, the moon comes up at the same time the sun goes down, they're, they're the moon is very full. And then like Enoch says, they look at each other the next morning, Sabbath morning. They'll be looking at each other for, say, about an hour. And uh, and that varies too. But once you're familiar with it, you it, it's very obvious which day of the Sabbath. Very obvious. And every once in a while, it's not. And that means you're on the international date line. It has to be somewhere. So there's somewhere where the day changes from one day to another. And not everybody will have a two-day new moon because of that phenomena. Uh, you know, like the whole world doesn't experience exactly the same thing. And obviously there has to be a change from one day to another. And it is not the international dateline. God didn't say somewhere in scriptures, this shall be the international dateline. No. So that's how you can tell where it is. And it changes every moon cycle. So anyway, and then the third quarter, again, is the, the what we call the 
sorry, <laughs> the third Sabbath is what we call the last quarter. In uh, right, there you are, our man-made terminology. That's the third Sabbath, and and once you determine the first one, you just count every seven days. Don't worry so much about whether it looks perfect or not. So that third quarter does often look a little off, uh, but sometimes let's say, but you know it's going to be seven days later, and then and then by the next seven days you don't see it at all. But there is a sign. It gives you a very strong indication. In fact, I'm going to say it's the proof, absolute proof. <laughs> no, that's not the right word, but you know it's going to be a two-day new moon if you get up on the last day of the working week before sunset, sunrise, like get up quite a bit early, say an hour, and go up out and watch the sun, the, what do they call it? Not dusk, the other one. You know, the dawn. Watch the dawn unfold. And if that moon comes up quite a long time before sunrise, so it's it's very clear if it comes up quite a ways before. And it'll be, you know, significantly large. You know, you can see it very clearly. And it, let's say it lasts for a good hour before the sun comes up or, well, even half an hour. Uh, yeah, close to an hour. But anyway, uh, on the though that tells you there's going to be a two-day new moon. If you can't see it at all, like, uh, or if it's just the faintest crescent, and again near the equator, probably you would see it. But up here in in Canada, you, most most time you can't see it. It's, it's too close to the sun, and the, the the light is diffused. Anyway, it's just a phenomena of where you are on Earth. But uh, if you don't see it at all, you can be quite certain it's going to be a one-day new moon. And if there's any doubt, and of course it has to be clear to be able to see these things, but if it's cloudy, ask God to open the, a hole up to see the moon. I've done that quite a number of times, and it's just absolutely amazing. This little hole open up, and you know, you get familiar with where the moon should be, and it'll present itself, and the cloud will then it'll cover over. And Anyway, uh, it's pretty cool. But uh, if you're absolutely, if you're, if you're in doubt, just keep a two-day new moon. What's, what's lost? One extra day of rest. Um, and in our wild world, we think we got to just have everything just exact, and we got to be working as much as we can be working, and that's our thinking, not God's. Okay. Uh, so we got this Sabbath day is the step one in learning about the nine appointed times. If you will go to those steps and start keeping the Sabbath when you can, start somewhere, and good chance God will make it possible for you to keep the keep it all the time. And if you're retired, that's that's pretty easy. Like I like I am, sort of. I still have lots of work to do, but at least I can I can uh, determine what I'm going to be doing each day instead of have to get to a job. Um, and I've mentioned uh, the Murray Sklar quite a no number of times. Uh, that's very valuable to help you see that we haven't understood in the recent past anything about the tribulation or very little. And look up Marie Sklar archives. It's changed a little bit over the time I've been talking about this, so uh, I'm not very good on the hunting on the internet. But uh, if you have those skills and or find someone that does, does find uh, the transcript. It's important because I've listened to uh, some people reading it. I think it was a 600 club. Is that what it's called? A 700 club. Anyway, the, uh, the guy added a bunch of stuff in there that just confused the matter. It was his own ideas he was throwing in there. But uh, if you can get the transcript, read it, and see that the, the whole plan of the tribulation was written out on 13 scrolls, and it has never been revealed up until a year ago, let's say, because that's when Maurice received the, the, this information. And uh, so whatever you learned be before that, let's say it was wrong. So let's just uh, trash whatever you thought you knew about the tribulation 
and open your heart and mind to some new ideas. Doesn't mean I got everything right, but I feel growing confidence that this is coming together for me. Okay, so uh, just to go over the Jubilee idea, there's there's 120 Jubilees between Adam and Eve being created and the end of 6,000 years. And that's the six working days that man and Satan are in partnership. And God is giving that. He's allotted that time for a few people to pursue God to the point that they will become completely obedient to him and he can work through them. And he can trust them. And those are called his first fruits. And there's going to be very, very few. Most believers don't give themselves wholly to God. Most believers don't study the scriptures. Most believers don't aren't filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, and spend time in prayer, in fasting, in meditation. Like those things are all needed to to really uh, develop this relationship with this personal relationship with with God. Anyway, um, God is looking for His first fruit. So He's now to break this down. These jubilees, there's 120 of them. There was 50 till the first Exodus, and that's the blueprint to the second one. So then there was another 70 in between, and that's the 70 sets of weeks of years that Daniel talked about. And we have kept saying the Christian church, oh, that's 70 weeks. No, it's 70 sets of weeks of years. They're talking about 70 jubilees, and in the uh, in Daniel, how it's explained that last jubilee is reserved for the great tribulation. So it's not seven years, it's seven sevens, or, or 49, and then we call it 50, God calls it 49, there's this one year, I'm going to say it's a year of celebration, but exactly the fine details, we're, go we're going to keep finding out, and I'm going to keep talking, and maybe it'll be given to me, or you, or but back to Revelation, start with keeping the Sabbath day. Saturday is not the Sabbath, and Sunday is not the Sabbath. Neither one come as signs from either the moon or the sun. That's a given. So start by resting on the Sabbath day. That's really, really important that we're obedient, and then Revelation comes to us. I want to talk a little bit about Zipporah. I've thrown her in the mix quite a number of times. She was the type of the bride. And they were, her and, and Moses were married at year three and a half, which in our scenario, which started a year and a half ago, will mean two years from now. So on select, selection day, two years from now, almost exactly, because we're coming right up on the 10th day of the first month. That's lamb selection day. And then four days later is, is the Passover, the day Yeshua died on the cross. And then he rose on the Feast of First Fruits three days after that, which was a weekly Sabbath. Anyway, back to Zipporah. The idea that Zipporah was, in a sense, kept hidden. When you read the three accounts, you see a little bit more in, in uh, Jubilees and Jasher to the story. But in the Book of Moses, Zipporah kind of drops out of the picture and we don't know what happened. She, what was reported is that she eventually was, well, very early in the, in the story of the four, last 41 years. She was sent to be go back home with her father, well, along with her two sons, or Moses' two sons, and uh, we don't hear too much about her. So the, the idea is the, the bride is kept hidden and in this, this unfolding story, uh, in in the Torah of Moses, it, the whole, the marriage and everything is not talked about. It's just all of a sudden we have Moses and Zipporah going across the desert, and they're confronted by the angel of the Lord, who was Jesus Christ, and he was about to kill Moses. And Zipporah, Zipporah stepped in and looked after the matter. She knew exactly what was going on. Moses had been told clearly to circumcise his both sons, and he did the second one, but he didn't do his first son because his father Jethro, who was a pagan, 
uh, a wise pagan, but a pagan nonetheless, he didn't want that done. And uh, so it was, he was giving re more respect to his father-in-law than to God. And God was not pleased with Moses doing this. And plus, Moses had to have a clean slate to go into Egypt and do this, this job that he had Moses to do. So anyway, and God knew this would all work out. He designed the whole thing. And they're all, all these things are metaphors. So God's servants always have to be cleansed before they can uh, do their job. The, the, the really important people had to walk purely before the Lord. So anyway, he had this one thing on his, on his record that he hadn't looked after. He, he was a kind of, I'll get around to it, uh, and never did get around to it. So Zipporah stepped in and circumcised the, the, the oldest son, uh, knowing the whole background and everything. She was probably, all the, those few years in be, that since the boy was born, and I could, I could give you all the days, uh, the years of this. this. I think the boys would be maybe uh, three, four, five, but uh, it's a little hard to sort out the story because you're putting three together and then trying to remember all these numbers. And the Torah of Moses doesn't start at year zero. Uh, it starts at um, two years before, more, more or less, before they left on the exodus. And even that, you didn't know until uh, in Jubilees, it says from the first time Moses appeared before Pharaoh to the second time was two years uh, past. And you didn't know that from the Torah. Moses doesn't say that. So you add all this extra information in. So anyway, they uh, Zipporah steps in. She had been bugging her husband for, let's say, five, four or five years uh, to circumcise this their their oldest boy and he oh yes dear i'll get around to it get around to it so anyway then that's the background and that's all written in uh either jubilees or or jasher but in the torah moses makes no sense at all why would god be about to kill moses and why would zipporah step in and make that prophetic announcement you are a bloody um, you are a bridegroom of blood and that was prophetic of Yeshua. He died and shed all his blood, and he was the bridegroom. Anyway, the point is Zipporah was kept hidden after a certain point, and it matches what happens in this, in this unfolding story, that the bride is married, and then she be, starts her uh, testimony of three and a half years, and she becomes the, like, the most uh, prominent uh, figure in the whole world because everybody's blaming her for causing all the problems that are unfolding like everything's getting worse and worse and worse the plagues and the wars getting worse and the and the pestilences and the crops are failing and and people are dying like uh, you know maybe by the end of the wit time of witness there might even be half the world's population have died so they're thinking she's causing everything and uh, so she's killed. She is the two witnesses. And uh, we see her leave in the air and be with the Lord forever. And then she's not seen after that. So that follows the story of how Zipporah, uh, at pretty much at the same point, kind of disappeared from the picture. We don't know what happened to her in the time in between. Really. And uh, she was just waiting. And, and then at the end of the... 40-year journey, of course, they're going to be re reunited. So uh, we see this great celebration in Revelation 19 where everybody's together, the bride, the bridesmaids, and the guests of the wedding who have just qualified by making this 40-year journey through the wilderness and the tenth that make it, that learn to be obedient, just like the bridesmaids had learned to be obedient much earlier, and the bride, of course, learned in her lifetime to be obedient and was picked as one of the 144,000. So then all these years later, uh, 40, uh, 40, whatever the numbers would be, we're at one and a half into it. So 46 years later, I might have that off, 47. There they are in Jerusalem, all together for this great, wonderful celebration, this year's celebration. 
in which Yeshua proclaims, we will all keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Read that in Zechariah right at the end. Make sure you keep this in mind, that these appointed times are mandatory. And they really are now. So if you are being obedient, you will be taking this to heart and start doing them if you're not already. And it's important that you study the calendar and start doing, uh, keeping the appointed times on their proper days. So start with the Sabbath day. The moon points out the Sabbath day four times every moon cycle, and then it goes dark for one or two days, and that's the new moon festival, and you don't work on those days. That's pointed out in Amos. And uh, I'll try and put that in my description. I've done this before, so it's important if this is stirring you, if you're beginning to understand these things and you feel the Holy Spirit saying, yes, this is right, then start going back and uh, watching some videos that where I covered some of these details. And I'm going to try and redo the important stuff. I, I can see that not many people go back. And to be honest, the further back I go, the, the more poorly I explain things. So it would be good to redo a whole bunch of things. Okay, now I'll, I'll quickly go over this scenario of the 49 years or the 50 years. See, our terminology is 40, is 40, is 50. God's terminology is 49. And I'm going to propose that that 50th year is a year of celebration. So we'll set that aside. We've got 49 years total. We've got one and a half done. I've pointed this out a number of times. The Jubilee, this present Jubilee started a year and a half ago. We're coming up on Lamb Selection Day, which is uh, exactly one and a half years since the tribulation started on the Day of Atonement back in 2018. So we got two years left till the marriage. Two years from Lamb Selection Day. Coming up here in a few days. A couple of weeks. Whatever. I pointed out the days. Um, I think Passover is April 3rd, if I remember right. Anyway, I point them all out. Make sure you mark them on your calendars. And I'll put them in my description, okay? Keep them. You know, uh, set them aside. If you're not, if you can do anything about not going to work that day or whatever you can do, spend extra time in prayer and, and press in on the Lord about revelation of these things. So once the marriage takes place, now it's a, remember in the, well, in the kind of the Hebrew, which is God, God created the whole concept of Hebrew. It means to cross over. That's what Abraham did. He believed God and he crossed over from where he was and what he was and who he was and what he was thinking, completely sold himself out to God. And that's what God wants all of us to do. He wants us all to cross over. That's why Pat picked that name or the Lord picked that name for her last book, Crossing the Line. We cross over to doing things God's way. We give up on our own ideas, our own intellect. Our intellect is what trips us up big time. Uh, just drop the idea that you can figure things out, that somehow you're smarter than God. He's a billion times smarter than we are. So back to this scenario. Okay, so we got two years to the marriage, and then there will be three and a half years of witnessing out of... Re out of <laughs> Jerusalem, center of operation, the bride will be given this these supernatural powers to move anywhere in the earth at, at an instant. And that was, uh, you'll remember in, the, I think it's the book of Acts, but uh, most people will know when Philip was transported. He was in one spot and all of a sudden he, he was somewhere else. Uh, God can do that. That's a piece of cake for God. And that's how he'll give us that ability. He'll send us to this nation, that nation, this place, that place. Send us all over the place at an instant, and but the center of operations is Jerusalem. So from the world's point of view, they'll have cameras on all this. Be on your TV screens. You'll see this this group of 144,000 people. Like you know, you're not going to be able to count them all, but there's lots of them. You know, they're the two witnesses. Some are are Jews, the house of Judah, and some are Christians, the house of Christian of Israel. There's 30,000 Jews, and I've given you these numbers before, and 114,000 Christians. They have the two testimonies. The Christians have the testimony that Jesus Christ is 
the Savior and the only way to salvation. His blood is the only way that covers our sins, as our past sins forgiven. And then the, the Jewish people have the testimony that the Torah, prophets, and writings are correct, legitimate, and we're supposed to be following and doing them. And then uh, they witness for three and a half years, then they're killed, and they go in, kind of disappear off the scene, just like Zipporah disappeared off the scene, right until the end of the tribulation. Now, whether we'll see bits and pieces of her during those 40 years in the wilderness, I, I don't know. But for the most part, it's hidden. It's kept a secret, let's say. So then... We know on the other end, we're, we're up to one and a half, plus two, plus three and a half. And we got 41 years we've set aside for the wilderness experience, 40 years on the trek. And they will cross the Red Sea. You know, they start in Africa, South Africa. So uh, remember, Senior Van uh, Rensburg saw the tent city all the way along the coastlines of Africa. They're all gathered into a huge troop. They, uh, they cross through the jungle and then through the Sahara Desert, cross the Jordan, I mean the Red Sea. They'll walk exact roads that the, that the ancient children of Israel walked, and then they will cross the Jordan at Gilgal. So this, again, this is a blueprint. So that whole thing takes 41 years. There's the one-year celebration. Anyway, we're left with one and a half when we add all that up. Uh, that I haven't accounted for. That will be the final vials poured out from Revelation 15.5 to 16.20. And that will be an equivalent to the ten plagues, one of them being the three days of darkness. So uh, that's a speculation and a proposal, but it fits in the blueprint. So those three days of darkness, if, if that's all correct, we won't see them for a number of years yet. And from this point to the end of those vials um, and the final start on the trek through the wilderness will be seven years from now. So we have a seven-year period from this point till we leave on the great exodus. And, of course, it, it might include leaving Canada and all the other na na nations where God's people have been gathered and there'll be gathering points in every nation, and they will, God will make a way for them to get to Africa. And there's lots of scriptures that talk about this, and I have a list of them. You know, before I run out of time, which I am, um, I'm going to give you 2 Barak 84, 8 to 15. Get a hold of, you can, you can get this on the, using the internet. <clears throat> and uh, that talks about uh, taking boats to get to where God's taken you. And I also want to uh, go to 2 Barak 28.2. Barak had asked the Lord, how long is the tribulation? And the answer, I'll read the answer. <clears throat> this is Barak 28.2. For the measure and reckoning of that time are two parts. So the tribulation comes in two parts, pieces or sections. And then he just says the total length, a week of weeks, which means the jubilee. So the whole tribulation, the answer is, is it's, uh, it's 49 years or, or 50 in God's term, in our terminology, and the two parts. So now I used to say it's 10 and, and 40, uh, that's roughly. So we got the first 10 years, How do they, what all happens in that 10 years? Well, we're a year and a half already, but we have a distinct seven years ahead of us. This, this where we're at right now with this coronavirus, and you can see there's a lot of things happening. The, the markets are crashing. Uh, the world is panicking, and it's like adding fuel to the fire. Like, they wouldn't have to panic. You know, yes, some people are going to die, just like they die from the flu every year, and heart attacks, and who knows how many other things, diabetes, 
that take a lot more lives than this coronavirus likely will, but, you know, we haven't seen the end yet. But the, the panic is crazy. And it's causing the world economy to stumble badly. So this could very well be the beginning of a whole lot of things that just escalate. And we got a crude oil crisis going on, and we had a poor crop last year. I'm going to propose we're down 20%. The, the powers that be aren't telling us, but they had a terrible crop in the States last year. And up in Canada, not much better, but it was mostly bad weather. Like we had volumes up here in Canada, but terrible so much of it was uh, taken off uh, high moisture and then has to be dried and it spoils very readily and there's a lot still out in the snow hasn't been harvested yet anyway i'm going to propose and speculate how about if i say i'm going to prophesy that the crop this coming year is going to be even worse this would be down 40 50 percent anyway we're facing hunger starvation and then add the locust uh, plague that's going on in uh, in Africa. Anyway, uh, heads up, it's important that we store some food. Don't go crazy. You know, whatever you can do, get... Uh, I don't think this will be... You'll have some windows to regroup, let's say. Turn your hearts completely to the Lord. He will show you how to navigate through the years ahead. I better get, before I, I'm already out of time, but I'll throw in these scriptures. I, I was looking for these two scriptures about going on boats, you know, in this final exodus. And uh, I ended up with quite a few that are very clear that God's gathering his people in this time frame to get them back to Israel. And uh, now we know there's a interim spot of South Africa. So anyway, 2 Barak 84 8 to 15, get that book, get this Joseph Lumpkin, Lost Books of the Bible, Great Rejected Texts, and it talks about the boats, getting in boats to get to where you're going, and then read all of Isaiah 49, Isaiah 27, 12, Isaiah 42, 13 to 29, all of 43, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 68 to 9. And there's more. I just was trying to find a scripture that talked about getting in boats, and I'm not sure I found it. But I found a whole bunch that talk about this final trek to get back home, to make our Aliyah eventually to Israel. But we're apparently we're stopping over in South Africa. And that's why Pat, my wife, and Vilna are there. They're beginning the preparations. I better sign out, Neil, with Rock Our World.